Hi there everyone and welcome back to Higher Biology. Today we're going to continue with Unit 2, Metabolism and Survival, and we're moving on to Key Area 3, which is Metabolic Rate. So in the first two key areas, we've been talking a little bit about metabolism. More specifically, in Key Area 2, we looked at respiration and how your body generates ATP, or generates energy. Today we're going to look at why we need to generate that energy, comparing it between different organisms, and how we can also measure it. So let's make a little start by talking about metabolic rate. So it's a term you might have heard of before. So we're aware that all living things require energy. Even if they're at rest and not being particularly active, you need energy to keep your uh, organs and your vital functions working in order to keep you alive. The quantity of energy that's consumed by an organism per unit of time is called your metabolic rate. And in this diagram here, we have the initials BMR. Your basal metabolic rate is the amount of calories that you need to consume, even at rest, just to survive. So we know that people need to take in uh, a certain amount of food, a certain amount of calories, even if they're not doing anything active, but just to keep your vital functions actually working and to ensure your survival. What we're going to be looking at, though, is how can we measure your metabolic rate? And this goes a little bit into what we talked about in terms of respiration. The three main ways of measuring your metabolic rate include the volume of oxygen that is consumed per unit of time in an organism, so the amount of oxygen that is used up. So think about cellular respiration, we need oxygen, your muscles and your tissues need oxygen in order to respire. The second is almost the opposite, it's the volume of carbon dioxide that is produced per unit of time. So if you're taking in oxygen for respiration, you're going to be producing carbon dioxide. And that could be a measurement of how high or how low your metabolic rate uh, actually is. The third one is your heat produced per unit of time. Because as your body and as your mitochondria are uh, creating or generating that energy, you're going to be producing your body heat. And that's something else we can measure. Now, there are the three ways of measuring, but there are different things we can use to make those measurements. The first one is the one we're going to focus on, which is a respirometer which is used to measure the oxygen uh, that you are taking in. The second is a calorimeter, which is used to measure the heat you produce. And the last two are a bit more simple. You have a carbon dioxide probe, which measures carbon dioxide levels, and we have an oxygen probe that me measures oxygen levels. So let's talk a little bit about the respirometer. So a respirometer is a fairly basic device like you can see in this diagram here. And what you would have is you'd have an organism in this sort of sealed tube here uh, with a tap that's closed to make sure no other air gets in. Essentially what happens here is there will be air in these tubes, but at this point, next to the measuring point, there will be a liquid. The idea being, as that organism takes in oxygen, as the gas moves its way up, the liquid is going to rise, it's going to be pulled upwards. And because we know where the liquid actually started on this uh, scale that we have here, we can see how much oxygen has been consumed over a period of time. In terms of how we can look at this from experimental design though, is what about carbon dioxide? If the organism is breathing in oxygen, it's going to be breathing out carbon dioxide. What we have is a chemical, usually potassium hydroxide, that is used to absorb that carbon dioxide there. So as this insect, for example, breathes in oxygen, then the tube is going to move up, the liquid is going to rise, and we can measure that rise per unit of time, but the carbon dioxide is just going to be absorbed down here and will have no effect. The other thing you can be asked though is how would you uh, use a control in this? How do you know it's the, the organism that is breathing in the oxygen and not something in the tube? What we do in order to, uh, to get rid of that issue is usually we would have a control on this side that's often either a uh, marble, a glass bead, or even a rock that's used to uh, use a control against the organism to show it's the organism that is respiring. So the basic principle of the respirometer is it is measuring the volume of oxygen that is used up uh, per unit of time as a measure of respiration. What we're going to look at for the rest of this key here, though, is a comparison of metabolic rates between different organisms, because it's not all the same. Metabolic rate varies from one organism to another, as long as even from one person to another. We're going to divide things up into birds and mammals, reptiles and amphibians, and fish. 
and what we're first of all going to be focusing on are birds and mammals, which have higher metabolic rates than reptiles, amphibians, and as fish. The other thing to remember though, is even within these classifications, is there are still differences in metabolic rates. So for example, humans and rodents are both animals, but they have very different metabolic rates, but we're just using these as a classification. So the main principle of this though, although we're going to look into these different classifications, is that birds and mammals have higher metabolic rates, and to support that different metabolic rate, we need to have a different circulatory system because they require more efficient delivery of oxygen to their cells. So for the rest of this key area, we are going to talk about the circulatory system, so the heart, the blood of these different organisms, but always remember the principal point of this is efficient delivery of oxygen. You, if you have a complex circulatory system, it's because you have a high metabolic rate, so you need to make sure that all your respiring tissues and cells can receive as much oxygen as efficiently as possible. And you'll see what I mean as we work through the different examples. So first of all, the circulatory system itself is composed of the heart, the blood, and also the blood vessels. So this might be a good time for you if you don't remember from National 5, or perhaps you've not done National 5, to look over the transport and animals key area, which you can find on the videos here. This goes into the structure of the, the heart, uh, the different blood vessels, and the composition of blood, which might make things a little bit easier and be good for you to revise. But from there on, we're going to focus on the anatomy of the heart, which is the form and the structure, and we're also going to look a little bit at the physiology, which is the function of the heart. As I've said, the main thing we need to focus on here is that organisms with high metabolic rates require the more efficient delivery of oxygen to cells. What this means is that you need an effective transport system, and it's usually more complex, to deliver large supplies of oxygen to respiring cells. So think of if you're working really hard, you're going to breathe heavier, you're having to take in more oxygen because you're respiring more and your muscles need that oxygen to produce that ATP or that energy. So we'll go into each one into a bit more detail, but already you can see the differences between the three different circulatory systems. So the fish looks quite simple, amphibians and reptiles looks a bit more complicated, a bit more like what we've looked at in National 5. And then finally, the birds and mammals is what we've looked at before, where we have uh, the four different chambers and we can see the different blood vessels going in opposite directions with oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. But we'll go through these individually. So we're going to start off with what we know. We're going to look at the circulatory system of birds and mammals. Now, first of all, what we term this is we call this a complete double circulatory system. And we'll go through this uh, in a little bit more detail. Hopefully you remember the atrium and the ventricles, or atria, from National 5, the different chambers of the heart. If you don't remember, the atrium is found at the top, and there's almost the entrance point, and the ventricle is below it. Different veins and arteries come off the atrium and ventricles to transport blood around the body. If we have a look at this standard uh, complete double circulatory system, we've got a complete system here, and you can see that everything is closed off. You've got these nice, neat chambers here. There are two atria, okay, there's the left and the right, there's two ventricles, and the chambers are separated by an area called a septum, just down the middle here. The other thing is that blood moves through the heart twice in each circuit. You might remember that uh, deoxygenated blood, so blood that's delivered all its oxygen around the body, comes in to the right atrium here, then to the right ventricle, and then gets sent to the lungs in order to gain more oxygen and get rid of the carbon dioxide out through the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery takes this deoxygenated blood to the lungs, where the blood then becomes oxygenated. It takes in oxygen. Then what happens is it goes back to the heart in order to get pumped around to the body. So it goes through the pulmonary vein, into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and then it is sent out through the aorta. And this double pump system of sending blood to the lungs for oxygen and to the body to deliver oxygen is what makes this a complete double circulatory system. The main part about this being complete is that there's absolutely no mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, as we just spoke about there. 
So remember, you've got your deoxygenated blood that's been used up to get sent to the lungs in order to gain oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. That blood that is now rich in oxygen is sent into this side of the heart where it does not mix with any other blood and it gets sent all around the body. So all that blood that's sent around the body has oxygen that it can deliver. The other thing as well, if you remember us talking in National 5, is that blood is sent out of the aorta especially at a very high pressure. This then gets sent to uh, tissues all around the body and we also have that thicker end of the heart there to ensure there's even higher pressure through the aorta to travel all the way around the body. What this does, again, like I said, this will keep coming back to this, is it enables more efficient oxygen delivery to cells. The oxygenated blood is not mixed with deoxygenated, and it's sent as a high pressure so it can be received by the rest of the body tissues. So this system that we started off with in birds and animals, this complete double circulatory system, is the most advanced circulatory system that we know of. It enables a warm-blooded or endothermic vertebrate to get huge volumes of oxygen to those respiring tissues. So remember, we're able to maintain those high metabolic rates because we have that effective high delivery of oxygen. And these tissues are going to release heat, they're going to keep our body warm and keep our body temperature up. It's this advanced but high metabolic rate system. We're going to go down a peg now to amphibians and reptiles. Now, as I said earlier, you can see there are some comparisons here. However, this is called an incomplete double circulatory system. And the features here are two atria, so again, we have the right and the left, but we have one ventricle in the middle that you may notice is quite an obvious difference from the complete double circulatory system. So what happens in this system is the right atrium receives deoxygenated blood returning from the body's capillaries. Fairly similar to what we've talked about before. The left atrium takes oxygenated blood that's been in the lungs in the capillary bed. Again, fairly system. However, the blood from both atria is passed into this single ventricle. So the deoxygenated and the oxygenated blood are mixing in the one ventricle before being pumped out either to the lungs or to the body. This is what makes this system incomplete and it makes it less effective than what we've looked at in the complete double circulatory system. Because there's this mixing of blood, there's less efficiency and it means that there's not as much oxygen being passed around the body, so it'd be much harder to maintain a high metabolic rate. Now finally, we're going to talk about fish, and as you can see, this is a very different system. So fish have a single circulatory system, and as you can see, there's one atrium and there is one ventricle. So it's another step down. It's nowhere near as efficient as the complete double circulatory system, it's not even as close to being efficient as the incomplete circulatory system. This is just a single circulatory system. So blood only passes through the heart once, which makes it single, in each complete circuit. The blood travels at a really high pressure to the gills. So if you think about fish and how they work, blood gets sent to the gills in order to obtain oxygen from the water. But as it goes through the gills and through the gill capillaries, there's a big drop in pressure. This means that the blood then gets delivered to the blood capillaries, the blood with oxygen in it, at a low pressure. And this works its way through, again, just going in this single cycle. So we can see here that we have this atrium and the ventricle. So you've got your deoxygenated blood that's given all this oxygen to uh, the body tissues in the fish, enters the atrium, then goes straight into the ventricle, and then gets pumped at that high pressure to the gills, at the gill capillary network, you're getting that oxygen from the water, and then at a lower pressure, this oxygenated blood is going through this basic aorta towards the body tissue capillaries, where the body tissues are going to gain that oxygen that has been delivered. So it's still doing the same job, it's still delivering oxygen, but again, it's nowhere near as effective at delivering oxygen, which is essential for high metabolic rates. And that's all you need to know for this key area. It is fairly short, uh, however, you need to make sure you know how you can measure metabolic rate. You should have an idea of experimental design of how you can make sure a respirometer is working correctly or how you use it. And the main thing is the comparison between different organisms with metabolic rates. And the whole thing comes down 
to the efficient delivery of oxygen. If you have a high metabolic rate, you need effective and efficient oxygen delivery, and that's why you don't want to have any mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood uh, in order to be more effective. I hope you found that video useful. Thank you very much for watching this. As always, everyone, I will continue with the Unit 2 um, Metabolism and Survival videos. Uh, hope you're doing well, and I'll speak to you again very soon. Thanks very much for listening.